So have you ever asked, why me? Come on, let's go ahead and confess. Anybody ever done the whole why me thing? Right? You know, just ever wondered why something happened to you, something painful, annoying, inconvenient, maybe tragic? Uh, like, why did my car break down? Why did my battery die? Why did I get the flat tire? Or why do they always get my order wrong at the restaurant? Any, any of you get the, your orders always wrong, you, that person? Okay. Stop special ordering everything then, right? <laughs> or how about, how come the line I choose at the grocery store is always the longest one? Right? I have that gift, by the way. If you're in a hurry, don't let me pick the line because I will pick the wrong one every time. Or on a more serious note, why did I get sick? Why did I get laid off? Why did I, why, how come I didn't get the job or the promotion? Why me? Why did I get cancer? Or my loved one get cancer? What, why, did, why was my child born with special needs? Why did the drunk driver hit me? Why did my loved one die? Why me? Why was I abused? Why was I abandoned? Why was I betrayed? Why was I convicted or addicted or arrested? Why me? You see, if you've ever wondered why me or why them and how come this bad stuff happens, then today uh, and the text we're looking at may help explain some things for you. The, the why the bad stuff happens, but, but also, more importantly, what God has done about it. Romans chapter 5 Beginning in verse 12, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church, people uh, uh, who believe in Jesus, in Rome, and this is what he says. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin, for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to a condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Wow, what a mouthful, huh? There's a lot of stuff going on in that passage. And the first thing I think the Apostle Paul wants us to see and understand is the power of sin to destroy. The power of sin to destroy. I want to call your attention back to verse 12 because this is the, the verse that frames the whole rest of the conversation in this passage. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all did what? Because we all sinned. All sinned. You see, here's the background. The Apostle Paul is referencing the story of creation in Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3. If you've never read Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3, that's your homework assignment today, okay? Go home, open it up. It won't take you very long. Read, it, read the story that, that the Apostle Paul is referencing here because this is the story of how the world got to be the way that it is. And he's saying, hey, you know, God created a perfect world. It was, there was no sin. There was no death. Everything was in perfect harmony with each other. Everything was in balance. Everything was, it was wonderful. And he put people in the middle of this garden, you know, uh, Adam and Eve, our ancestors. And, uh, and I don't know if you noticed this, but he said through one man, you know, all this stuff happened. And if you read the story, you're going to find out that Eve kind of went first. She's like, hey, Adam, there's a tree over here. 
Let's have some fruit. What do you say? And of course, Adam, being a guy, will do anything that a naked woman says. <laughs> and so, you know, God holds him responsible. The Apostle Paul holds him responsible. Uh, it's Adam. And so he, he rebelled. And guess what? We all rebelled with him. And so because of Adam's choice, everything was messed up. Nothing was the same that it was before. When you look at creation, when you see all the world around you, understand this is not how God made it. It is tainted. It is, it is broken because sin destroys the world. Sin destroys the world. Uh, see, when sin was brought into the world, it unleashed destructive forces in the world. Uh, and instead of functioning in harmony now, the world is out of control. It's kind of like, if you imagine this, God created the world like a spinning top, and it was perfect, and it would just go on forever. And then when Adam and Eve rebelled, it was like they thumped it, and now it's out of balance, and it's wobbling. And it started wobbling a little bit, and the longer it goes, the more that it wobbles until eventually it's going to crash and burn. Uh, we'll talk about that later. But when you look at the world now, you see destructive forces all around it. So when, when tsunamis happen or earthquakes or tornadoes or hurricanes or floods or fires or any of the things we call natural disasters, understand that, that those things that are destructive are a result of sin being brought into the world. It's not, you know, the way that God created it. Those forces of destruction are part of the result of Adam and Eve's rebellion and what it did to this planet. And that means that things like disease, birth defects, illnesses, accidents, all the effects of aging like heart disease and, and Parkinson's or Alzheimer's, all of that are because sin is in the world. This world is tainted, it's broken, it's messed up. People can talk about, well, you know, people are the problem, and, you know, no, it, sin is the problem. Now, granted, we're the ones who started the whole sin thing, but, uh, but the reality is this world isn't a perfect place that we're messing up. The world is messed up because of sin. It's, it's infected, if you will, which is why Scripture says that when Jesus comes to conclude history as we know it, God's going to destroy this world and recreate, make a new heaven and a new earth that are untainted by sin. It's going to be back uh, better than it was in the very beginning. It's going to be perfect once again. So uh, the world is broken. It's dying because of the effect of sin. Sin destroys our world and sin destroys our lives. Sin destroys our world and sin destroys our lives. Adam sinned. He rebelled and it resulted in death. Through one man, sin entered the world and through sin, death. But here's the thing. Every single person that has walked the earth since, with the exception of Jesus Christ, has sinned and rebelled. Each of us has sinned against God. We've rebelled against God. And by doing that, we have invited death into our lives. Each one of us, we've invited death into our lives. So through Adam's sin, you know, sin came into the world and through sin, death. And therefore, death came to all because all did what? Yeah. So we've invited death into our lives. And, and the reality is we are natural born sinners. We're natural born sinners. This is what we do. We, we, our ancestors started it, and we follow in the family history of being natural-born sinners. And I love it when people talk about, you know, children being so sweet and innocent. Uh, you know what that tells me? When somebody says children are sweet and innocent, it means that they've never hung out with toddlers. <laughs> right? Because children are sweet, definitely, but innocent, not so much. I took my two-year-old grandson to the store the other day because uh, he needed a bigger squirt gun. And... Uh, <laughs> And I'm a papa, so I'm going to buy him a bigger squirt gun. But apparently his parents don't take him into the toy section a whole lot because he went crazy. He, he's like, look at this, look at this, look at this. I want it, I want it, I want it. I need it, you know. And, and I'm like, I'm pretty sure that his mom and dad never sat him down and said, okay, here's how to covet. Here's your lesson in greed today. I want to teach you how to be greedy. No, he just naturally wants it all. Seen him with kids over at his house and suddenly all of those toys that he's got too many of, suddenly he wants to hold on to all of them and not share them. They're mine. You can't have them. They never sat down and said, here's how to be selfish. It just, it's part of us. We're natural born sinners. And as natural born sinners, we're naturally self-destructive. 
When we talk about inviting death into our lives, we do it personally, each one of us. We destroy ourselves. Think about it, overeating, self-destruction. I'm guilty of that one. Alcohol abuse, drug abuse, laziness, tobacco use, sleep deprivation, workaholism, video games, porn addiction, promiscuity, all of them and many more are self-destructive behaviors. But we don't stop there. We don't stop there. We, our carelessness, our, our selfishness hurts others. Our words hurt others, especially our, our kids. Because they're listening and they hear and we're, we're pouring into their lives. And when we're angry and when we're uh, destructive with our words, then we curse them. Uh, our, our, we set examples of destruction for our, our children to follow. We betray, we abuse, we offend, we gossip, we lie, we steal. So our destructive actions not only hurt ourselves, but we destroy others at the same time. And we know it and we see it and we understand it, and yet we still choose destruction. I, I mean, you've been there, haven't you? You're looking at a choice, you know this is the wrong thing to do, I shouldn't do this, this is going to be bad for me, it's going to be bad for other people, and yet we do it anyway. We are self-destructive, and that self-destruction hurts others. So when people want to know why, when you want to know why me, when you have that indication inside of you that screams, why me? Here's the answer to every single why me question there really is. And by the way, this doesn't do anything to lessen the pain of the loss or the tragedy or the hurt that you're in. This is just you, us understanding so we can speak into other people's lives a little bit. We live in a world that is wrecked by sin that is randomly destructive. Okay, the effects of sin are everywhere and they're gonna randomly impact all of us. We also act in self-destructive ways and so do the people around us, causing pain to ourselves and to others. That's the why me. Honestly, when you really understand this, you start asking the question, why not me? A whole lot more. Let me illustrate what this looks like. And I've shared this illustration before, and it's kind of disgusting, and, and, uh, and I apologize for that, except I really want it to stick with you, because I want you to think through this. Um, it it kind of goes like this. Let's just pretend that since God created the world, it, he created it as a giant swimming pool. And he put Adam and Eve in the swimming pool, and he had one rule, don't pee in the pool, right? Because if you have a swimming pool, that's kind of one of your rules, Right? You, I mean, you guys don't want people to I, pee in your pool either. I, I love it when I go into the people's uh, backyards and you see their signs by their pool. Like one, one of my favorites was, this is my ool. You notice there's no pee in it. Please keep it that way. I thought that was pretty cool. But my favorite sign of all time in somebody's backyard was, I don't swim in your toilet. Don't pee in my pool. <laughs> so God had a rule. He said, hey, don't, don't pee in the pool. Just keep it clean. And for a while, you know, they got out like, yeah, okay, we'll do that. But one day they were lazy, decided they were going to disobey God, and so they peed in the pool. And they went, oh, well, I can get away with that. What do you know? So they kept doing it. And, uh, and you know, it was no big deal because it was just them, and there weren't a whole lot of people there. So they swam away from it. And then they got really lazy, and, of course, they pooped in the pool. Uh, <laughs> because once you start down that road, then it just kind of happens. Uh, and, and it wasn't a big deal at first because, you know, they could swim away from it and it was a big pool. But then they had kids and their kids had kids and their kids had kids, kids, kids had kids. And pretty soon we're all swimming in the pool. And because we're like our ancestors, we're all peeing in the pool. Only now it's not a pool, it's a cesspool. Yeah, we're swimming in a cesspool. And, and we didn't just pee in the pool, we pooped in the pool too. Come on, let's just go ahead and admit it. We've done it. We've invited death into it. And if you're swimming in a cesspool, you're gonna, bad stuff's going to happen, but then eventually you're going to run into floaties too. <laughs> it's going to happen, right? And, and when you do, you don't really know whether that's yours or your loved ones or some stranger from halfway around the world. And it really honestly doesn't matter because it's still a floaty. You see, we're in a cesspool. That's this world we're living in, and it's tainted by sin, and it's tainted by sin because all of us have been sinning, and it's all of our stuff together, and it's all the stuff from our ancestors for thousands upon thousands of years that have accumulated, and it's not getting any better. That's our reality. And like I said, it means when you understand that, you don't go, why me? You start going, why not me? Why isn't it worse? Why aren't I sick? Why, are, why haven't bad things happened? Because... Sin destroys. It destroys our world and it destroys our lives. 
And the Apostle Paul wants us to see the power of sin to destroy, but he also wants us to understand the power of Christ to redeem. The power of Christ to redeem. Because people will often ask, well, you know, once we messed up the world, why didn't God fix it? Why didn't he step in and rescue us? Why didn't he do something about it to solve the problem? And the answer is he did. He sent his one and only son into this world, into this cesspool to take your sins and my sins upon himself to, to rescue us from this life of destruction so that we could have a new life. And so he paid the price of our sins on the cross so that we could be redeemed. That's what God did. He fixed the problem. We just don't see the, the, the results of that immediately. So God invaded our broken world in Jesus and he offers us, first of all, justification. Justification. Look at verses 15 and 16. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, talking about Adam and his sin, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the results of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. Now, that's a big word. What in the world does justification actually mean? It means that we are sinners, we are rebels, we are unrighteous, we are unjust, we are guilty. And because we are guilty, we deserve condemnation. We deserve hell. And yet, Jesus died for our sin. Jesus died for our guilt. Uh, and understand, Scripture says that when he was on the cross, literally, he became sin. He became your sin and my sin. Not just in some generic big picture sense, but literally all of your rebellion and all of my rebellion was put on Jesus. The whole world's rebellion was put on Jesus until he became sin and he became the sacrifice for sin so that we, when we confess Jesus as Lord, our guilt is atoned for and we are declared not guilty by God. We are justified before God. Understand that we are justified before God, not because of anything that we've done, not because we did our time, not because we paid our debt, not any reason of anything you've done. We are justified because Jesus died for us. He paid the price for our sin. And, and in that moment that we confess Jesus as Lord, then we are justified, which is like God looks at us just as if I'd never sinned. Just as if I'd never sinned. That's what justification means. I like to think of it this way. I deserve hell. Absolutely and 100%, I deserve hell. But because of Jesus, I get heaven. So God redeemed us by justifying us. And then God redeems us by giving us life. Look at verse 17 and 21. For if because of one man's trespass... Death reigned through that one man. Much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Verse 21, as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God wants to give us life. We were trapped in the destruction of sin, but Jesus set us free to live abundantly, to live joyfully, to live gracefully. And the promise that God gives us is eternal life, a new creation. Do you understand what the new creation is going to look like? Revelation 21 describes it this way. New heaven, new earth, new, new bodies, new life, but there's no more suffering or sorrow or death or pain. Isn't that amazing? We can't even comprehend a life without suffering, sorrow, death, or pain. But we look at this world, the cesspool that we live in sometimes, and we go, there's suffering over there. Why doesn't God do something about it? There's sorrow and brokenness and heartache right here. Why doesn't God do something about it? There's death all around us, disease and famine and war and hatred. Why doesn't God do something about it? And there's pain. I'm in pain. They're in pain. Why doesn't God take it away? And the answer is he has. And he is. But we need to know the promise of forgiveness, the promise of restoration, the promise of wholeness, this life that God wants to give us in Jesus Christ because he came into the cesspool that we live in to redeem us from it 
but that means we have to finish out our time in it. And then we get the new. Then we get the new body. Then we get the new world, the new creation, the new heaven, the new earth, no more suffering, no more sorrow, no more death, no more pain. But we need to know that promise is real. Because when you understand the promise of eternal life, when you understand what God is offering you, it changes the way that you experience the cesspool today. It changes the way that you see the world. You begin to see God's glory. You begin to see his beauty. It changes the way that you understand what's going on and it changes our attitudes about life. Because then we can live joyfully. We can live hopefully. We can encourage those people around us. But we have to know that the promise is real. See, I, I know a lot of Christians that they, they say they believe in the promise of eternal life, but all they do is complain about the world that they live in. They say they know the promise of eternal life, but all they do is get angry about the things they don't like in the world. And I'm just telling you right now, that's not evidence that you know the promise of eternal life. Because when you know that one day, soon, there's gonna be no more suffering or sorrow or death or pain, it changes your whole attitude where you see the tragedies and, and you can still have hope and you go through the pain and you know that God can redeem and you experience the loss or the disease, and you can live through it with a different attitude because you know that one day all that's gonna be done away with. In other words, you know that one, what you're going through right now is just temporary. It's just for the moment. And God has promised healing and life beyond this world. Doesn't mean we stop living in this world. In fact, it's just the opposite of that. It allows us to live freer. It allows us to live fuller. It allows us to live with joy like never before when we know that promise is real. So today, do you know that promise is real? Is it rooted deep down in your soul that you understand that you have eternal life? That whatever you're going through, whatever you're facing, whatever struggles you have, it, it is temporary and God can heal and God can restore and God can redeem and God has promised that and one day is waiting for you. In other words, do you know that the best is yet to come? See, the people who have that hope, they don't live looking back at the good old days, you know, longing for something in the past. That's a myth anyway. But instead, they live focused on the future, knowing that God's best is yet to come, knowing that God is redeeming this world, knowing that you have hope because of Jesus. If you don't know that the best is yet to come, if your soul doesn't buy into that just yet, would you see us after the service? Prayer team, pastors, we just, we want to talk with you. We want to make sure that you leave with that hope intact. Because the power of sin to destroy is real. The power of Christ to redeem is greater. But we can't leave this passage without discussing the power of one. The power of one. I don't know if you noticed this or not when I read the whole passage all the way through, but the phrase one man is used nine times in nine verses. It's kind of a big deal. You know, Paul kept talking about the one. Now, he was using them to contrast these two figures. Because uh, one man, he said really clearly, introduced death. That's Adam. You know, he talked about Adam introduced death, and Adam brought the curse on us. And because of Adam, we've got condemnation. Because of Adam, we're guilty. And, and he kept going on and on and on again. Sin reigned, uh, and death reigned because of Adam. And then he contrasted Adam with Jesus because he said one man provides life. One man provides life. That man is Jesus. Jesus paid for your sins. Jesus gave, gives you grace, gives you hope, gives you life. He wants you to reign in life. He wants you to have uh, his overcoming ability to face the world and thrive. One man provides life. He gave us this grace and this mercy that is so great. His sacrifice paid our debt and set us free. So he's talking about the power of one. So I got to ask this question. Kind of hope it haunts you all week long. Where is your one life leading? Where's your one life leading? Because you've got these two lives that are a contrast. And so you're either going to follow Adam to destruction. By the way, that's our natural bent. 
to follow Adam. I mean, we're children of Adam. We, we want to, you know, live out that rebellion that he started us on. You know, that natural stuff, as we talked about with little ones, we're just naturally selfish. We're naturally greedy. We're naturally all those things that are destructive. Are you following Adam or are you following Jesus? Because Jesus wants to lead you to life. He wants to give you hope. He wants to use your life powerfully. Which path are you on? Which, which one is your life leaning into? Because none of us do it perfect. But which one has the main thing? I mean, are you, are you following Jesus most of the time and every now and then kind of pausing and doing an Adam thing? Or are you following Adam pretty actively and every now and then showing up in church? Which direction is your life leading? And this is an important uh, question because it doesn't just impact you, it impacts other people because you are a powerful person. You are a significant person. Your life has an impact on this world. You're making a difference, whether you realize that or not, on the people around you. And, and, and I know that I just said that, and I know it's true, but I know some of you are sitting here and you're going, yeah, but that's not true with me. You're sitting here right now, and, you're, and, and Satan is telling you that you're insignificant, you're unimportant, uh, nobody cares, your life doesn't matter, you don't have any influence, uh, all that stuff, and that's a lie. Your life is powerful. Just like Adam, it, you realize that Adam's life is still having a ripple effect on us now, eons later? And your life has a ripple effect way beyond what you know. Way beyond what you understand, way beyond what you imagine. Think about all the people that your life influences. For instance, if you're married, you're influencing your spouse. In fact, when you took vows before people and you said, uh, I do to this person, you know what scripture says? For this cause a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and the two become one flesh. There is no, if you're married, there is nothing you can do that does not impact your spouse at all, Period. Absolutely. You say, oh, this just hurts me. It doesn't hurt them. No, because if it hurts you, it hurts them. And so whatever good you do is going to bless them. Whatever bad you do is going to curse them. Everything you do has an impact on their life. And then what about your kids or your grandkids? Everything you do has an impact on them. You go, I don't have any influence on anybody. Well, if you do, if you have a family, and I don't care if your kids are grown, it still has an impact on them. I was driving the other day, grandson in the back seat, two and a half years old. I think he's clueless. I think he's just looking out the window, whatever. And I see something and I go, that sucks. <laughs> From the back seat, I hear, that sucks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the next time I saw something I didn't like, I went, oh, that's not good. <laughs> right, because we have an impact we have an influence way beyond what we think, way, way beyond what we imagine. So are you influencing them toward Adam and destruction or toward Jesus and life? It doesn't stop there. By the way, there's some of you, I just got to pause here, and I know this because you, you've got kids that are grown and you're following Jesus now and you're leaning into life, but right now you're going, what do I do? Because I, for 20, 30, 40 years, I led them the wrong direction. How do, how do I redeem that? How do I fix that? Because they're not following Jesus now. They're following Adam and it's my fault. Uh, well, first of all, you know that you're on the path that, that is redemptive now. And so praise God for that. But if, if you really want to have an influence that's positive, then you probably need to go to him and repent. You need to have a really difficult healing conversation that goes something like this. Hey, uh, I just got to apologize because I really led you astray. I, I made some choices. I valued some things that were invaluable. I, I, you know, I didn't give you a great example to follow, and I was wrong about that. By the way, apologizing to your kids for what you did wrong is really healing for them. And some of you never heard that from your parents don't continue that curse. Go ahead and say you're sorry and, and let them know how important Jesus is to you and then pray for them like crazy. But they gotta see it. They gotta see the change in your life. They gotta hear it in your words of blessings that used to be curses. They gotta hear it in your affirmations that used to be condemnations. They, they need to see it in the way you treat them and the way you treat other people. They need to see the reality of Christ in your life. And then hold on because God will work miracles. 
But you have an impact beyond your family. You have an impact on your friends, on your coworkers, on the, the people that you bump into at restaurants and doctor's offices and grocery stores and in the parks and, and at your kids' games and all that kind of stuff. All of that influence is, is huge. You have a tremendous ripple effect, even if you think nobody pays attention to you. You have a powerful life that God has given you. And you're leading people toward Adam or you're leading people toward Jesus. So where is your one life leading? Because I pray that you are living in the redemption of Jesus. Now I also know that some of you may be sitting here today kind of going, hey, you know what? Uh, my life has not been leading where I want it to and I want to change. That is awesome. Then what are you going to do today to change it? Today, because a lot of times people have these thoughts so like I need to change stuff and they walk out the doors and they just keep living exactly the same life. What are you going to do today? How are we going to do it differently today? Maybe today is the day you go, hey, you know what? I need to go up and pray with the prayer team at the end of the service and I've been thinking I needed to do that, but I need to do that today. Are you going to do that? Or maybe you need to show up at the park and get baptized because you've been thinking, I know I need to confess Christ. I know I need to make a decision to, to make this Jesus thing real in my life. And, and I haven't followed through. I've been putting it off and I've got all these lame excuses I've been using. But today I'm going to make it different. Or maybe it means you need to talk to a pastor and set up a time to counsel with someone and, and, and share what's been going on in your life and the brokenness that's there. Or maybe you need to show up at Celebrate Recovery tomorrow night at 6.30 right down here in the student wing because you've been dealing with a habit or a hang up or an addiction that is just been plaguing your life for decades. And every year you say, this is the year I'm gonna beat it and it's been going on 27 years now and you haven't done it yet. So maybe it's time to ask for help. Or maybe it's time for you to serve because you're sitting there and you've been gifted by God and you've got experience and wisdom and you've been on the sidelines for way too long. See, it's called repentance. When we make a change in our behavior to follow Jesus, it's repentance. And God delights in our repentance because he's, we're following Jesus then and he's going to lead us to life. So where is your life leading? The one thing I know is this. You're the one who decides which direction it's going to go. Jesus is calling. I sure pray that you follow him. Let's pray together.